Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas this week, for the Welcome to the show, world. Dr. Paul Coming to you from 43 art historian, south, photographer, explorer, and Tasmania. member of the My name is Gordon, and I death. shall be your host. Paul is the author of multiple books, including Empire of Death, Heavenly Bodies, and most recently, A Cat's Tale, A Journey Through Feline History, which he co-authored with his cat, Barber. Paul joins us today to talk about catacomb saints, death rites, the impact of cats on the development of civilization, and people who mine jade under the instruction of UFOs. Great stuff. Enjoy. Paul, thank you very much for your time. Of course, Gordon. Um, my pleasure. Nice one, nice one. Well, you are a first-time guest, and as first-time guest, uh, you get the traditional first question, which is, Paul, were you a weird kid? Yeah, yeah, I was. That was um, remarkably pronounced, actually. Um, one of my big hobbies, actually, as a child, was freezing unusual things into ice cubes. I was fascinated with it. And uh, my mother, of course, hated this because she'd wake up and there'd be flies or snails or toenail clippings frozen into the ice cubes. But I was absolutely fascinated with turning strange things into ice. So you must have had like a big ice cube tray then because snails are, I mean, I get flies, but snails are kind of big. It had to, yeah, it's America, it's America. <laughs> We had many ice cube trays in many different sizes. And not only that, I'm telling you, it's America. We had snails of all different sizes in the yard. Oh, awesome. awesome. Well, so was that the beginning, would you say, of your art career? I mean, how does that, um, is that something that you decided, you know what, I'm first ice and then the world? Was it something like that? No, I went through several of these phases as a child. Um, yes, I was a remarkably unusual, chi unusual child, although I should point out that the snails I froze and the flies, they were always dead. That was always consistent. I didn't want to hurt them. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, no, I don't think that was the beginning of anything other than my parents distrusting me. And but it, so maybe because they were all dead. So maybe it was the beginning. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. You well, you know, it's ironic, I suppose, that I first became known for writing writing books about mummies and corpses and so forth because my great grandfather actually um, was something of a body snatcher. So there, there is a connection there, I guess. I had never made that with the dead snails and the dead flies. Yeah, it's burial customs in a way. I mean, you're sort of exploring the. The preservation of uh, of earthly remains. I mean, you can say that when you have, when you're when you're elderly and they have a retrospective, you can you can put that on the on the panel at the beginning as people walk in with their wines. Well, why, my great grandfather and my my grandfather told me about this. They were Greek, but they lived in Egypt. And at the time when my grandfather was quite young, there was still a trade in mummia, which is you know is that mummy dust that was mistaken for a pharmaceutical, and people would sort it as a general cure all. And there really, by that time, in the early part of the 20th century and so forth, there really weren't a lot of mummies out there in Egypt that you could easily get. And so what they would do, what my great-grandfather would do for extra cash would be to steal bodies or bribe someone at the morgue for these bodies, and they'd cover them over in tar. And they'd take them out to the Sahara Desert, and they would bury them in a pit for like a year. You know, the Sahara would do what it does, you know, and basically serve as an oven and bake them. And then they would just dig these bodies back up and take them into Cairo and sell them as authentic Egyptian mummies for people in Europe to snort up their nose. Wow, yeah, that is quite late because that that sort of fake mummy business was 
Um, no, it's actually not, and th this is interesting, because Merck, the pharmaceutical company, still had Mumia in their catalog up until like the 1930s. It's amazing. They, um, when the market fell out of that, because I have a bit of an Egypt history nerd myself, they ended up using them for things like fuel on, on trains in Britain, because they're like, what are we going to do with all, <laughs> all, all these fake mummies? But the yeah, bitumen burning them. And using them for garden fertilizer, actually, a tragic, tragic story. The largest shipment of cat mummies ever sent to Europe all got ground up and used as garden fertilizer in England. Amazing. And yeah, just, as you say, tragic. Uh, tragic. <laughs> history is fraught. History is fraught. And, and, the, and the doing of it is fraught. Um, how did you become a historian then? How do you go from ice cubes to an art history PhD? Was there a point along the line where you encountered material as a kid or at high school where you're like, oh, I'm going to be about this? Well, oh, God. Um, I suppose that would be a very long question to unwind. Um, I specifically, though, did not become a historian historian per se, I became an art historian because I really like working with the past through visual culture. I would not consider myself a, a, a proper art historian in that I don't really do a lot of iconography and I don't work with Rembrandt and so forth. Um, more like a kind of visual anthropology, I guess, but it's really important for me in the study of history to work with images. It was always my biggest passion. It's not just studying the past, but studying the past through images and decoding the images and getting them to make a certain point. Yeah, fair enough. I would, it's funny, it's your career, but I would push back on it. And I, I'm reminded of something Terence McKenna, who was himself an uh, art historian, said that like the world needs more radical art historians because it is, uh, uh, he thought, and I think there's a, it's a very defensible position, it is a uh, it is a, a really really robust way into kind of like reclaiming narratives and identity and so on. You mentioned that yeah, you can be an art historian and and know where Rembrandt got his paints from and 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 you know be sort of wheeled around Europe saying that one's fake, that one's you know that one's a real one or whatever. But there is yeah, and so forth. Yeah, yeah it never yeah. never appealed to me. Um, I really don't give, it's funny because my, my area of expertise in theory is actually European Baroque. Uh, but in grad school, I was working on prints and I was working on outsiders and I was working on the construction of, let's say, alternative identity and so forth. And a lot of this macabre stuff, and I, I really don't give two hoots what, you know, where Rembrandt bought the pigment for his blue. I don't care. Yeah, good. <laughs> Um, all right then, so what, is there at some point, if you sort of looking at visuals and an interest in the macabre and so on, how did that become, um, Empire of Death was the first book, right? Yeah, well there are, th there are three books and uh, it's not really a series because they don't follow themselves as a line, but uh, Empire of Death, Heavenly Bodies, Memento Mori, and then the latest book, which is written by my cat, which seems completely disconnected, but if we want to talk about it, there actually is a connection between all four. But um, yeah, the first one was Empire of Death, and I, I got into that because in grad school, I was, I was kind of the Fox Mulder of grad school, if you know the X-Files reference, just working on all this weird stuff that everybody else had left out and completely kind of unseen it. And when I graduated with my PhD, you know, I, I had all the tools to do real research and I had access to incredible libraries. I just had nothing I was really that interested in. And traveling around in Europe, kind of bumming around for several months after I finished my PhD, it, it occurred to me by chance, some chance encounters, how many ossuaries there actually were that nobody knew about and nobody cared about. And people even in the cities didn't realize that some of these bone rooms were under the streets they were walking on. And I became much more fascinated with those places than the places which were famous, you know, than the places which were tourist attractions. And so when I got back to the United States, I started making a list and I started doing some research and I realized what an amazingly large Part of people's spiritual lives, the dead actually were in these bone rooms full of the dead actually prayed, and it had just been left out of our telling of history, not because of them, but because of us, because we were just uncomfortable 
with the subject of, you know, inviting the dead to continue to share in our spiritual lives. So, like, you felt you were, I mean, agreed, absolutely. Um, and that's going to find particular resonance, I think, with the uh, the listenership. But you, um, there, was, there was a point where it's like, okay, this is, this is one of those big untold kind of stories, right? And and it was, because what I'm getting at, especially with, I mean, I bought Heavenly Bodies um, yeah. as part of, like ages ago, as part of just kind of like boning up on research, pun intended, uh, for a Euro trip that um, I was living in London at the time, didn't end up happening. That was going to go to like Fontenelle Cemetery and San Gennaro um, catacombs yeah. in, in Naples and then back into Rome and, and all the rest of it. So I was boning up um uh, on the dead and it occurred to me as i was flipping through that one which is stunning um did anything weird happen to you in in the creating of these books oh god yes um i mean first of all how can you travel around europe for years you know visiting skeletons and mummies and so forth and not have anything weird happen yep. um but i are you talking about normal weird or are you talking about um supernatural weird? well um well there's another i don't use the word supernatural um because i don't think that right yeah. i get it <laughs> i i don't like the term myself because if it happens it's part of the it is actually a natural consequence of something that we just don't understand yes so um i i, I mean I agree I, I tend to use i i'm probably like you i tend to use that term for other people Convenient. Yes, exactly. But is that what you're talking yes, about? Yes, I am. Is that what you're Spectral, talking about? Spectral, spooky, you mentioned the X-Files, something like that. Like if you, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, a few times. Um, it's hard with these kinds of stories because um, when you tell them, people people think you're implying that it's a certain thing. It's, you know, it's a, it's a ghost story or something. And I, I always point out, I don't even know what a ghost is. Correct. You know, uh, I believe there are phenomenon that we we cannot see and they're around us. And, and there is an explanation for things that we consider unexplained. And there's, there's so much surrounding us that we don't see or don't understand or don't know. Um, uh, I tend to tell these stories as matter of fact and let people pass their own judgments on them so i i have to give that caveat first um but the most extra i'll tell you one it's the most extraordinary of all of them it was really a strange occurrence and it was the first time i went to bolivia because i was photographing i i went for like 12 years in a row to bolivia every november 8th to photograph this skull festival and it's called the fiesta de las nutitas and uh the, the nutitas are these um these skulls that sort of serve as a, a focal point for spirits to enter into the home. And the skulls are treated as members of the family and so forth. And there are some people, Yatiri, who would, you know, it, not a good translation, but kind of like a female shaman figure. But these Yatiri often have many of them, and their ha houses are like shrines for these indigenous Ar uh, Aymara people who are really into this cult of the Nyatitas. And some of these people, I've met some, some Yatiri that have 80 or 90 skulls in their house. I mean, they, they have their own charnel house, literally. Anyway, so the first time I went down there, I visited this woman named Dona Anna, who's a Yatiri, and she had a lot of these skulls. She had made maybe 18 of these skulls in her house that were considered miracle working. And, and people would come in and treat her home as a shrine. And so I visited her and I talked to her and I explained the research I was doing and what I was doing. And, and I asked her, can I go in and take some pictures of, of the skulls? And she's like, yes, absolutely, that's fine. So I go in and I took a bunch of photos, but I took a lot of them on film just because the black and white, I always did film. And for extremely low light, film often performs better than digital anyway. So mostly I had taken them on film because of the extreme low light in our house. Anyway, so I had these priceless film scripts, you know, that, that really no one outside of Bolivia at that point had really seen anything like that. You know, the inside of one of these shrines in, in one of these, these Yatiri's homes. And I brought them back on the plane. They were undeveloped and I brought them back, you know, in my lap in a box, because they were so precious to me. And um, that night I, I arrived home and that night I left the box on the floor and I went to bed. And in the middle of the night, I heard this voice in my ear saying to me, it's like, where's Anna? Where's Anna? And I jumped out of bed, like, what the hell is someone in my house? And I turned on the light, there's nothing there. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm just, I've 
you know, I flew for 20 hours. I'm just kind of going nuts. I really need to get some sleep. Turned the light back on, and there was this big bang, this thumping noise in the middle of the living room. Turned the light on again, wondering if the cats knocked something down. Nothing there. The next morning, I finally wake up, and I go to get those boxes. They are gone. They just, they were gone. Disappeared. I searched the entire house. Nothing. I was like, did I... Did I hallucinate bringing them in with me? I called the airport in Dallas. They did not, no one had turned them in or found them, but somehow I knew they were gone. They just disappeared. And the next year when I was down there, I went and visited Donia Anna again. And she, and I told her the story. And she says to me, it's like, well, they disappeared. The problem was you didn't ask permission to take the pictures, so the spirits took them back. It's like, I did ask permission. I sat here in front of you and asked you if I could photograph the skulls. And you said, yes. And she said, I said yes, but they didn't say yes. You needed to ask them. So you need to do it again this year. Go back in that room and just ask them. So I went in the room and I said, can I please take some pictures? And then she looked at me and said, yes, they say yes, that's fine. So I took the pictures and they, it was fine. And I never had another problem at her house. Do you take, uh, do you ask permission now um, since that time? Whenever, maybe not just in, um, you know, Donna Anna's house, but anywhere else you're taking pictures? In Bolivia, I always do now. In Bolivia, I always do because I realized whether or not I believe the spirits are there in the room, it's important to upholding the integrity of the custom. Yeah. Yeah, that's I like it. That's a thank you for that one. Uh, that's a really cool story. Uh, ghost stories are always uh, always welcome uh, around here. Like I say, you can call it a ghost. You can call it whatever you want. I mean, maybe there's a chance that on some very deep level, I felt guilty that somehow I knew that I hadn't followed some ethical path in taking the pictures. Maybe somehow I figured that out and. I don't know. Maybe unconsciously, I threw them in the trash. I don't know. I can't explain it. But so even like I said, that, I like even if that is what happened, um, that can still be a ghost story. Like it's a theory of mind problem, isn't it? It's like, what do you think? What yeah. do you think a thought is, yeah. and and so on. And I think we are singularly terrible at um, leaving the door open for possibility in the West, um, for sure. Yes. Um, anything like that uh, that happened with heavenly bodies in particular, and how did? Because what I one of the things I, I like about this book, and I've always been uh, reasonably interested in the catacomb saints, and we're about to talk about that for people who are unaware of what they are. Um, they're speaking of Europe. It's almost how to describe this right. It's a mistreatment of the dead in many respects. <laughs> the whole story of the catacomb is saying it's like um, digging people up, digging unsuspected bodies up, exporting them north, and then kind of sheepishly hiding them away at the end of the sort of mania of it, right? So how, what was the process of going about um, photographing many of these things, that, these splendid things um, that are- Well, okay, for, first I think it's important from my, my perspective, just for any listeners who, who don't fully understand what you're talking about, to give, if I can give a very brief Please. explanation. Yep, all right, so um, anyway, what he's talking about with the catacomb saints and digging these people up unsuspectingly, um, after the Protestant Reformation, of course, the, the Catholic Church was had, had several problems, uh, one of which involved the, the attack on the cult of relics. And so, you know, Protestants would destroy the relics and so forth. Anyway, uh, the Catholics, when they were trying to re-found certain churches and certain dioceses in, in areas that had been battlegrounds with the Protestants. So we're talking now, um, you know, during the Counter-Reformation. So after 1578, uh, when the Catholics started trying to re-found some of these churches and re-establish their presence in places that had been especially especially hot, like, like parts of Germany and parts of Switzerland and so forth, um, they needed relics because many of the relics had been destroyed. And technically, they, they really did need relics because you can't technically find a church or have an altar without relics. What they did was, you know, relics don't grow on trees, but what they found is maybe they grow under the ground in Rome, apparently. They, they had rediscovered the, the ancient Roman catacombs, and they figured, well, this would be a source of relics. Because you know these people died during that time, and 
at, you know, ancient Rome during the time, many of them had died during the time of the Christian persecutions. And so technically some of them could be martyrs and martyrs actually, it's the technical thing, but martyrs have the same potential status as, as a saint, you know, in, in terms of acting as a devotional object. And so they sent excavators, teams of excavators down there to look for, um, to look for the relics specifically of martyrs to send them to Northern Europe to refound these churches. Uh, of course, you know, down in these ancient catacombs, it's very hard to tell whose skeleton is that of a Christian or a Roman or a Jew and who was a martyr, who was anything else. And so they used a lot of unscrupulous methods. And basically what you're referring to is they just basically grabbed out anyone they wanted who somehow seemed appropriate to them and shipped them north. And so you could wind up having, you know, like a, a Jewish fry cook wind up sitting in a Catholic church as Saint so-and-so and being, you know, reborn as a martyr. Well, literally rebaptize. They called it Batizati. Like they would pull them out and they would rebaptize them as these martyrs and send them north. Anyway, and so, but what they did was, and what you're talking about, you know, looking fabulous. Um, you know, previously relics had been these tiny things, like a tiny sliver of bone and so forth in a giant glass case. Now the relics themselves became giant. They, the relics basically overtook the reliquaries because they were sending entire skeletons reassembling the entire skeletons, covering them with jewels, and all the, you know, the gold and the jewels and all the attention they'd paid to the reliquary, they now paid to the relic. And these were entire articulated skeletons entirely covered in gold and jewels and incredible sights. And there was a point to it because these were going into what had been hot spots during the Protestant Reformation to kind of tell people, it's like, well, you know, these people were martyrs and they sacrificed their lives for God. And this is the glory which they are given. This is our earthly manifestation of this heavenly glory, you know, the, you know, the heavenly Jerusalem and so forth to really wow people. And, you know, the Catholics knew what they were doing because. Yeah, you know, it's, such, tangible, it's such Roman logic. I, I mean, a tangible, physical, a tangible, visible symbol like that of power and of yeah. wealth and magnificence will win people over. Anyway, you said, you know, then kind of casting them aside or, you know, neglecting them. Um, and then after the enlightenment, there comes a time when people start looking at their churches and they say, uh, why do we have this skeleton covered in jewels sitting in the doorway of our church? This is, it, it seems almost pagan in its, you know, in this demonstration. And so they, then they started getting rid of them, hiding them, disassembling them. Many of them were simply destroyed. Some of them were hidden away. One of them I found was buried inside a wall. They literally put it in a wall and plastered over it to get rid of them. Um, and so they, they became, again, another one of these lost parts of ecclesiastic history, which really appealed to me because they are so, uh, for those people who haven't seen them, um, look up catacomb saints or catacomb and heilige in German, and, and you'll see how stunning they are. They're the finest works of art ever constructed in human bone. Yeah, that's true. That's a good way of thinking about it. They are stunning. I, and I just, I love the Catholic logic of it, even if it isn't conscious it's sort of because i don't think people realize how extensive the catacombs under under rome actually are so oh, there, and there's many of them there's so yeah. many of them yeah 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 and and it's this sort of sending an army of the dead north to sort of like reclaim the empire it's just it, well it, it literally was an army i mean that you know it, they literally were you know they became these dead people kind of became frontline soldiers in the war against protestantism and they were good soldiers they were effective in what they did in winning people's hearts back yeah, it, and and they, it looks, it, yeah, it's like um, Versace, the necromancer. It's just, it's so Roman, it's perfect. Um, and I, I love the the story of it, I think it's really beautiful. I, I actually like the hidden corners of, um, of the things that Catholics are now um, ashamed of. Not the pedophilia, no one likes that bit, but like indulgences and, and all those kind of like bizarre, um, bizarre praxis like, like catacomb saints. Because it must have been, if you lived in some grim little low countries town, um, you know, a population 500 to 900 people. And it would have one, been actually a pretty big town at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and then one day um, the, the priest has this like gleaming body of someone whose stories you've grown up having to hear about on, on a particular saint's day or so on. 
that would have been electrifying. And it's just, it's a testament. Uh, I remember years ago at a Google event, um, they had some guy who was a brand consultant to the Catholic Church. And he said, they've been in business for 1600 years. Like if you want to know branding, there's probably a thing or two they can teach you, right? Um, and you just look at it and go, it's perfect. It is, it is the, the ultimate counter-reformation flex because it's Roman. So the, but the Pope is sitting on these catacombs. So it's, it's, it hits every bit of that kind of like unconscious transformational campaign. It comes from Rome. It's, it's, it's a saint or ambassador. It looks like that kind of glory and power. Um, it's just the most amazing campaign. Well, you know, it was also, it appealed to me, if, you know, initially it appealed to me just visually when I first started finding them, because I found them at the tail end of when I was working on Heavenly Bodies. I, I'm sorry, I found them at the tail end of when I was working on the Empire of Death, and that's, and, you know, as soon as that book was turned in, the first book, actually, uh, the publisher was in London, and I went into their office, and I just took a stack of photos I had already taken of the Catacomb Saints, and I laid them on his desk and said, here's the next book. You know, and it did one immediately turned into the other because they looked at the photos and they're like, yeah, just do it, figure it out. These are sensational. Um, and we've never seen anyone write about these before. Um, it, it appealed to me, you know, initially visually, but it, it really appealed to me more over time um, as, as, a very, as a very complicated story of, you know, real legitimate piety and at the same time, complete subterfuge, you know, because there is a real legitimate faith in these skeletons as objects. And at the same time, there's just so much crooked business going on with them as well. Um, you know, a lot of them, obviously, from what we already said, I'm sure the listener will realize a lot of them were not martyrs. A lot of them could have been whoever, but whoever they were, were reborn as oftentimes these completely exalted personages. Because, you know, nowadays we have Google and so forth to check things out, and they simply didn't have that then, and they didn't even have access to libraries to look things up. And so they would just call them things that they thought people would like. So they'd send out several versions of St. Valentine. You know, because who doesn't want the patron saint of love in their town? And I remember I was somewhere, I think it was like Crumbach or something, and to this day, they still have the skeleton of Valentine there. And, and just the stories about him, the people were so absolutely dedicated to St. Valentine. St. Valentine, the patron saint of Krumbach. And, you know, the, the local music teacher back in the day wrote a, a special, some kind of special musical fugue in his honor. And, and every year on St. Valentine's Day that, you know, couples and husbands and wives and lovers would be get together and they'd march and they'd stand in front of the skeleton of God knows who he was, because he's not St. Valentine, because the actual St. Valentine has always been in Italy. So they'd stand in front of this unknown person that they had been hoodwinked by the Catholic Church into believing was the real St. Valentine, and they would, you know, re-exchange their marriage vows and so forth, and it was really complicated and really strange, you know? Mm. I delight in making that true. Do you know what I mean? Because it's sort of, it's, it's the other side of a theory of mind conversation. It's a materiality conversation. So I remember um, I used to do, before I moved down here, a lot of scuba diving. And the last time I was diving on, in Chuk Lagoon on like this Japanese ghost fleet, it occurred to me down there that the, um, the sunken ships have been reefs for longer than they were ships at this point. Yeah. So, are they, so are they reefs? Are they reefs or are they ships? Right. Yeah. yeah. And we can go, no, well, they're ships. And I'm like, no, but are they? Because, <laughs> because the fish have been experiencing them as reefs for longer than we did as um, ships. And when it comes to the bones of some anonymous, hope, well, when I say hopefully Christian, could be pagan, could be Jewish guy, um, all RuPaul drag raced out as St. Valentine somewhere in Germany. Um, the fact that it sort of expands the thought form, archetype, whatever you want, um, the image of St. Valentine, it's a way you can make it true. Do you know what I mean? Like it's the, Oh, I the, do know what you mean, and that was what was so fascinating about it. He, he literally became St. Valentine for a thousand people. Yeah, very cool. 
um, one of the things I delight in the book, and I'll get you because we did sort of briefly touch on it, the, um, the the acts of devotion and piety that go into it. I'm sure you're very struck by, like the 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 um, the process of of getting them um, bejeweled, involving you know different nuns and specialties and so on. Like, tell us about that. Well. Uh, yeah. It's it's actually not that big a surprise, really, because if you have something that you believe is a sacred object, you need someone with the proper temperament to deal with, you know, sacred objects, ecclesiastic objects. And so a lot of them were decorated by nuns, especially teams of nuns, um, which sometimes would come as a surprise to people, uh, but it really shouldn't. Like I said, you needed people with the proper temperament to deal with, um, you know, sacred objects, and nuns would certainly have that. But in addition, you would need, and you look at this and it's clear, you need first class artists. And that is where people don't understand nuns and nunneries and convents back in the day. Remember that a convent has to have an economy, it has to support itself somehow, right? And oftentimes they would do it through, through manual arts, you know? Nuns were the best embroiderers, for instance. So they were skilled in textile working. Many nuns were also trained in um, jewelry making and so forth. And so a lot of these nuns just never received credit for their skill in the visual arts, simply because they were women and they were nuns and they labored anonymously on behalf of God. Um, but yeah, they were the perfect choice for working with these skeletons. The only thing they really didn't have was a background in, in anatomy and working with bones, and it shows sometimes. I mean, I would look at some of these guys and it's like, okay, um, why does he have all molars in his mouth? You know, it's like you put the wrong teeth in there or something. Or, you know, sometimes it's like clearly, you know, these these leg bones are mismatched or something. But yeah, nuns were the perfect choice to do it. They many of them were incredibly skilled in the manual arts and they had the proper temperament. I also, I find it kind of beautiful that, because, um, you know, they're believers, or at least you would hope so, uh, especially people would, in the 15th, 16th century, people would um, pack their daughters off um, quite young to a convent, right? The, the spare sure. daughters. And yeah, yeah especially on the 14-year-old girl, you hear the sort of clatter of the, the cart showing up at the front of the convent, and then all of a sudden there's, you know, the saint um, in bones in front of you. Would it, like, I find that really beautiful that you, it, it's, that it isn't just a, a technical brilliance that is on display in, in the adornments for the catacomb saints. It's, it's genuinely devotional, like they were. Yeah, well, like it's not quite the clatter of a cart and someone just unloads a skeleton, though. I do know a lot about that. And there was, and a lot of the process, of course, couldn't be fit into the book for editorial reasons. You know, we have word limits. Um, but just the arrival of the skeleton itself was was often quite a process. Um, they would know it's arriving. Word would have been sent ahead, and they would be welcoming it as you know it would be in a box. You know, it would be packed away in a box with with seals on it from Rome. But they'd be you know welcoming it as if they were welcoming the highest level VIP personage. You know, so there would oftentimes be a huge procession just to bring this box into the convent, you know, and like kind of like a public holiday. And then when it, the, the term uh, for, for moving a relic is actually the translation. So the translation, you know, the final stage of the translation of the relic was a very big deal. And then after it had been finished with the decoration, which could take years, um, you know, moving it and setting up in the church was a massive public holiday. Like, you know, everybody in the town would be on the streets waiting and watching and cheering. Right. And it seems to have been successful, right? Like you mentioned, you can kind of look at um, baby names at the time in, in towns, can't you? And sort of... Be yeah, the, the... That, that's a, and that was a great way of, of testing um, the popularity of one of these saints. You know, it's like if suddenly... Uh, let's say you have a um, Saint Benedictus that's translated to your town. And if within the next 10 years, suddenly you have a bunch of baptismal records showing that all these kids are suddenly being named Benedictus, that was one very good way of telling whether or not it had been successful and you know popular in the town. And another way, of course, the, the, the biggest way is just financial contributions to the church. True. 
<laughs> follow the money. Um, do you think, I don't know, I think I think both things about this, right? So you're definitely the right person to ask because Heavenly Bodies was the second book after a sort of, um, and then, you know, subsequent ones, a, a very cross-cultural or ethnographic uh, exploration of um, relics. I mean, I know that's a specifically Catholic term, right? Um, but that, I guess that's my point. Is there a precedent for uh, relics and consequently things like uh, catacombs, saints elsewhere, or is it a mostly Christian innovation? No, 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 it's not. Um, in terms of uh, in, in terms of Christian stuff, of course, it's uh, it's only a couple thousand years old. But remember, there are many cultures that that collect relics and use them. Um, and for some reason in the West, we don't really think of it that much, but Buddhists especially, you know, um, you know, those, those early stupas and so forth in India, they were all built to, to hold some, some relic of the Buddha. I have been to Buddhist temples. I, I was at a Buddhist temple in, in Southern California that had over a hundred purported relics. So... <sighs> There's some, here's the thing, and, and there's some of it in the book, because I agree, like if you, you, I think back to the um, Neanderthal skulls that are about 50,000 years old that are sort of on shelves in caves in what's now modern day Israel, and you've kind of got like a, some sort of, I, I don't mean it literally, but like a skull, we don't know what their cosmology is, but there is something about the, the head posthumously that's involved in, in the spirituality of, of a Neanderthal, right? So it's, it's universal and, and very, very old. But you kind of mentioned in the book as well, something that I, um, with a particular interest in saints, find fascinating, which is early Christianity was a kind of gross death cult anyway. So in the sense that their kind of Jewish and Roman neighbors were like, what are these creeps doing? Well, yeah. Well, the Christians were per partic in particularly in particular known for for this kind of obsession with death. But I, I, in all fairness, you know, most religions tend to exist not entirely, but certainly in part, to to give us some answer to that question which gnaws at everybody, which is what happens on the other side. Um, it is with Christianity. Uh, it tended to take on a very visual aspect. Yeah, I think there's more to it than that, though. Like Romans and Jews, you would be, um, you'd get miasma, you'd be needed to be cleansed if you spent too much time amongst the dead. And in the meantime, the Christians were like living in graveyards waiting, is today the rapture? You know, like in the first few centuries, they thought Jesus was coming back, like, is it, is it time yet, <laughs> you know? And so there's something kind of really... And that's part of it, because it also there's that fixation on bodily resurrection. Yeah, and, and that's why I'm, I, I feel like there is something unique about Catholic relics in, because they have an origin in what is a sort of very materialist um, death cult, like in its first 150 years. What? I just don't know what it is. Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, well, let's talk about it technically. Um, because, you know, you know, we're talking about either the veneration or, of, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, say, say these skulls in a cave, and you're talking about maybe the veneration of certain uh, bodily parts and, or, you know, maybe some, some kind of ancestor cult or something. Um, with Christianity, is, is there something unique? Well, there's something very unique about it because Christianity, um, and then, well, of course, at first it wasn't a separate Catholic, it was just Christianity. But Christianity starts out in this way with the relics and then the Catholics are the ones who really promote it with the relics being parts of beings, the saints who can be intercessors. And nobody else really does that. You know, I can, you know, you talk about, I, and I'm probably getting lost right now um, in the way I'm saying it, but let me clarify. You know, you're talking about these skulls in a cave, and I was talking about these skulls in Bolivia and so forth. Okay, those are not intercessors. 
you know, you don't go to one of those skulls in Bolivia and ask that skull to intercede for you with the highest power. Um, the skull can help provide things for you and it can provide advice for you and so forth, but it doesn't intercede on with God on your behalf. And that's what the Catholics establish. They establish this system where where the saints are literally intercessors for you, that if you have a problem and you need something, St. Peter or St. Mark or one of these saints can actually act as your intercessor with God to get you supernatural aid from the highest possible source. And these relics were this devotional item to kind of help you, you know, help you focus this energy on the saint so that the saint can help you. And so the Catholics, had, I think, had have taken relics in a very different direction than anyone had because of the role of the saints as intercessors. Yeah, I like it. I think that might be what I'm looking for. Because in, in the early, in those first few centuries, well, 150 years, give, give or take, when they're basically just graveyard creeps at the edge of cities. Um, or underneath them, or wherever it happens to be, like Saint Jerome. If in those, f you you had like a bloodline lineage back, maybe only to a, a historical figure. I don't think actually existed physically, but you can kind of go back three generations to get to an apostle. And there's like an actual. It's uh, it it's far more like a mystery cult. And so if you have died having had that, yeah, I get it. So the even the recently deceased are with christ but also have magical powers of being transformed by him so it's yeah this sort of rebound necromancy that, that intercession yeah, i like yeah, well, it and, and and well and there is a necromancy aspect to it um because you know so far we've been talking about it from a more theological perspective rather than from a, a popular perspective which is really kind of a mistake because people don't really, you know, the average guy, especially, you know, in the 15 or 1600s or whenever, he, he's not a theologian and he doesn't live his Catholicism or Christianity according to a textbook. You know, he lives it according to whatever the popular version is. And in fact, it's, it's interesting because I was talking about the skulls in Bolivia. Many of those people, many of them who are Aymara also consider themselves to be Catholic. They consider themselves to be Catholic and Aymara at the same time. And the Catholic Church in La Paz absolutely hates it. The bishop has spoken out against it. He doesn't want those skulls around. They're not part, you know, these, these skulls dug up from a graveyard um, in Bolivia are in, you know, prayed to are not a part of Catholic worship and in fact they're idolatry. But these people, in terms of their local popular Catholicism, do consider that to be part of Catholic worship as well. Just as interestingly, are you familiar with the Menene? In uh, possibly. What's that? Possibly, yeah. but yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. And those who don't know it, it's a it's a kind of mummy festival in Tana Taraja on Sulawesi in Indonesia. And I've gone there and photographed it before, and it's fantastic. It's these people, you know, they they mummify their relatives, and they're in the tomb. And every once in a while, they'll take them out, and they'll ha kind of have a procession. And they'll walk them around. They'll they'll redress the mummies and take them around, take them home, you know, introduce them to the rest of the family. Many of these people, many of them, also consider themselves to be Catholic. In Indonesia, in Tana Taraja, many of them do consider themselves to be Catholic. So there is this popular religion that is really more prominent and more influential than the um, than the textbook religion and that's where you get a lot of the necromancy that's where it really comes from it comes from people who are into this popular version of catholicism much more than it comes from you know the textbooks and the theology books and you had mentioned the fontanelle cemetery in naples uh, earlier and that is, you know, maybe the greatest example of European necromancy, because for those who aren't familiar with it, the, Pop the Fontenelle Cemetery in Naples is a kind of cave ossuary filled with generations and generations of bones. And people were absolutely convinced if they went down there, you know, this is not something the bishop is going to approve of, but people were convinced if they went down there and found the right skull and adopted that skull and took care of that skull and gave it a little shrine and provided offerings to it, that it would provide supernatural assistance to them. 
And in textbook Catholicism, there is absolutely nothing that says some anonymous dead guy that you found in a cave and you don't even know who he is has the power to cure illnesses. That is necromancy. That is not Catholicism at all, but it becomes part of popular Catholicism. Yeah, I, I agree. I absolutely love it. Um, I think that's universally attested in a funny way. So I have a, a guy who, whenever he writes a book on Thai magic, comes on the show, um, Jenks. And he's lived there, he's English, but he's lived there for like 30 years now. And he says that the basically the religion of Thailand is, and it's sort of the same for places like South Korea, even if you're atheist, you're animist. And then there's the sort of um at high state occasions, if you're doing it, you'll you'll admit you'll say you're a Buddhist, you won't say you're we well, you wouldn't say you're an animist, but you won't say you're in, involved in some sort of cult of ancestor and, and nature spirits. You say very politely that you're a Buddhist in the same way you very politely say you're a Catholic if you're Aymara. Um, it's still true, but so is the other thing. And we have, uh, yeah, uh, that does initially, I think, to people who are outside those sort of cosmovisions. Yeah. Nice one. Well, I, um, Obviously, without giving away uh, your address, but our mutual friend, um, Chris, who uh, made this introduction, has kind of put in some topic areas that he thinks uh, would lead to fruitful discussion. So without giving people your actual address, Paul, um, where do you live and why? <laughs> they can have my address if they want. Good luck getting there. <laughs> but yeah, tell us, tell us about where you live, because it's pretty... Well, pretty I, live out in the, I live out in the California desert now. Um, uh, I actually escaped from Los Angeles at what turned out to be the best possible time. I escaped a few months before the pandemic started, and I've been living out in the desert since then. Um, and, you know, it's pretty much Mad Max world out here. Um, people who live out in the desert or who have spent time out here will really understand what it's like. Um, but it's a you know it's a fascinating it's it's a fascinating place. I'm not exactly off grid, but I'm kind of close to it. And is that like I mean has that changed things for you creatively? I mean, is uh, well, it? Well, yeah, you've encountered. You know well, what I mean? You know, it's really. I get a lot of questions from people. It's like, how do you like living out in the desert? How, what has it changed? Blah blah blah. And it's like I I really can't answer these questions. Because I move out here, and you know, and then uh, several months later, this pandemic begins, and so ah, uh, I can't, you know, it's, you, you know, you know what I'm getting at. It's really hard for me to gauge what changes I've gone through are really due to living out in the desert, and and to what extent they're influenced by the pandemic. It's really yeah, hard to pull these things apart. Um, I, you know, it's a, I'll tell you, it, I, I'm really much happier being out here than I am in a city. Um, you know, it's a great place. You know, you might, if it's going to be a pandemic, you might as well go ahead and live in the post-apocalyptic world out here that already <laughs> exists ready for you. Um, I spend a lot of my time now. I mean, you know, in terms of working, I am in theory working on another book, but my, you know, I'm having a real hard time with it. Sometimes I'm only writing a paragraph a day. It's just, it is really hard to work right now. And I don't think that's because of the desert. I actually think that is because I'm so distracted because of the news around me, basically my country completely falling apart and because of the pandemic. But I spend a lot of my time out here, you know, exploring abandoned mines, exploring ghost towns, just going out and discovering um, you know, ancient prehistoric sites out here. The, you know, America, even even more than Australia, I think America has really determined that that history only starts when Europeans arrive, you know? And it is so untrue. I mean, I found prehistoric sites that, uh, you know, with paintings from 10,000 years ago out here, just amazing stuff. Yeah, that's, uh, and it's funny, because I, I wanted to kind of head in that direction because there's a, there is a strange bit, strange but stark medicine in that realization that um yeah uh, america's ha has seen better times than than right now right and i'm sure there are people who are thinking like well is this gonna fall over and you think well maybe but um even if it does it, it doesn't it has boiled over it's a question of how much is boiling out of the pot yeah but if you can go and find um evidence of things that have passed away 
and yet we're still here. I find a medicine in things like ruins and old sites, right? Which is like, it's just that kind of like, this is what happens. So it's not, and I find that very comforting when we do encounter times that are a bit extreme, shall we say, that we maybe wouldn't necessarily want to go through, but I, I find that kind of um, calming. Well, it's interesting out here because one thing it's showed me, and you know, you're right um, in, in what you're saying, but it's also shown me, I think how in so many ways we've allowed ourselves to become weak and we've allowed ourselves to become captives of our own technology and not realize what we're capable of wandering around out here and finding these fantastic old things in places that people no longer consider to be habitable. Like people will tell you in some of these places, you know, it's like, no, it's impossible to live out there. It's like, really go take a look. Because people were living out there for a really long time and they were flourishing. And even some of these miners, you know, who were mining a century ago, 150 years ago, you go look at the places they built and these things they built which are absolutely incredible and they were flourishing there and they had buildings and towns there and now it's all you know now it, it's just a ghost but it's uh you know but in a place where we don't think we can survive even with all our technology and all our advantages they survived quite well without those things I uh, couldn't agree more, and and they had good lives with it. I I, I think. Well, I, I don't know. I don't. I, I'll be quite honest. I don't think being a gold miner in Death Valley was a really great life. But they. I think. They I think what I meant is that, and you would know this. Um, one of the things that's so appealing about the desert is the um, night sky, right? So oh, sure. the the sort of um, the phenomenological immediacy of of living somewhere that we would now consider remote or extreme, and it is both of those things, is. I think it's good in that sense <laughs> that you get that you get something that is not um, mediated the way it is in, in the 21st century. Um, and I, th I think about so I live in southern Tasmania, and the town I live in, well, I live on the edge of it, used to be five or six times the size. And and it's the various changes in the economy. It used to be a, a logging town, and then the logging went away, and then it used to be an orchard town, and then that went away, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and even further south, a hundred years ago, and I mean, like I'm at basically the edge of the road in Australia. I'm closer to Antarctica than I am to, I think, Brisbane or Cairns. Like it's, I'm my own kind of remote, right? And the, the ghost town remnants that are further south than me, hundreds of people lived down there. They had a train, they had all this great stuff. Oh, and you think, sure. I mean, there are towns in Death Valley that you can pretty much no longer get to without extreme hardship, but those were flourishing, functioning towns at one time. Yeah, amazing, yeah. So did the spelunking come first and then you moved to the desert? Like, do you know what I mean? Or did you get to the desert? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had, no, yes it did. I had already been exploring a lot of that stuff. I mean, you know, one thing that, that I think unifies all the stuff I'm interested in is that, you know, nobody else seems to be that interested in it. You know, I like things that are obscure. Um, which is why I got into the charnel houses and why I got into the catacomb saints and why I eventually wrote a book on feline history too. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I like to go out and find these ghost towns and these abandoned mines and so forth because no one else is really doing it. Yeah, it, but is there, is that its appeal? Because I also think there's almost a Tolkien-esque psychological interest oh, yeah. in- Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I like mean, being, look, I, um, I, I wouldn't advise anyone else doing some of these things. It, it can be super dangerous. Uh, you know, you can wind up stuck in a hole in the bottom of the desert. Um, you know, so there is this incredible sense of adventure. There's also this sense of mystery. It's like, where is this place? And how, how do I get there? How do I find it? Oftentimes I'll have to, you know, it might take me five or six failures in order to find one of these old sites in some cases. And so it becomes, in that case, kind of like a quest to find this mythical, what, what has become a mythical place. Yeah, um, like underground initiation chambers, apparently. Uh, yeah, well, I, I took our mutual friend to one of those. Yeah, very I cool. Another one of those I've been trying to track down, and uh, four times in a row I've failed, but I, I think I'm getting close. So that's going to be fun. That's going to be, you know. That's its own kind of prospecting, which I think is very appropriate for the area. Uh, but on that note, actually, uh, 
I just saw this on your Instagram as I was getting ready. Uh, yeah. Who was Barry Storm? Oh, that's a weird story. I was there this weekend. Uh, Barry Storm uh, was a writer who um, had had some success in Hollywood in the 1940s. A book that he had written was then um, turned into a screenplay starring Glenn Ford, who was, you know, a very big American actor at the time, one of the biggest. And he had, so he had some definite success in Hollywood in the 1940s. And then um, by the late 40s, he was traveling around out in the desert and uh, three UFOs appeared over him. This was at the very beginning of the UFO craze in the United States. Although, you know, Roswell becomes famous, but some of these other early stories are not nearly as famous. But he's one of these early stories and these three UFOs appear in, in the sky over him and they shine a light down on him. And they tell him to follow them. And so he follows them down this road east of Joshua Tree called um, uh, Black Eagle Mine Road. And he follows them down this old dirt road and they tell him to turn right and go behind this mountain. And over in this point, he's going to discover uh, jade. And it's, he's going to start mining jade because they tell him that this is where the Mayans had gotten all their ceremonial jade, you know, some of the highest quality jade in the world. And so Barry Storm does this. And there is jade there. That's the amazing thing. It's not good jade, actually, because the, the aliens had lied to him uh, in that the Mayans certainly did not get their jade from there. The Mayans did not like bad jade. This is the kind of jade you get in cheap jewelry at Chinatown. It's called nephrite. And um, there are tons and tons of it there. It's still lying on the ground. It's just everywhere. He spent almost maybe 20 years out there mining this jade. Um, so I went out the other day to discover his jade mine and see what was left. And I did find it. Um, it's, it's still out there. The tunnels are there. The jade is there. I brought a couple of giant pieces of this jade home for my cats. They were not particularly impressed with it, but it, it's one of these very, just, the, the desert's full of things. You know, it's just, it always kind of seeks, kind of attracts these, these mystics and these seekers, and um, he was one of them. Yeah, it's amazing. I wonder how long, if, if you mined Nephrite for 20 years, do you think he died cursing aliens? Do you know what I mean? Because- no, You uh, know, it's weird. There's there's a lot that's weird with him. Um. Well, obviously, um, but even more than I've mentioned, when I started walking around the hillsides, because I had read bits of his story before, when I started walking around on the hillsides, what I had noticed that no one had mentioned was that there are these cairns, you know, these these piles of rocks sitting around that they're they're dipped in silver paint, and there are these old weather old weathered pieces of shiny metal on top of them in a pyramidal shape. So I don't know what those are about and how those fit into anything, unless maybe they had something to do with the UFOs. And then on top of the hill, above his actual tunnel, because he did have one, one large subterranean tunnel where he would be pulling the jade out of, but you could also just kind of pull it out of the, the hill itself. On top of the hill, there is this iron door set into the hill and it is impregnable. Like I hugged at it and pulled at it and tried to force it and it just will not budge. Now this thing probably hasn't been open for 60 years since he left. You can see where some other visitors to the site have tried to chip away at the rock around it, I guess to see if they could get inside. You can't because it's set into the hill in concrete, reinforced with metal and it's, it's impregnable and you know what's behind what was very storm hiding behind this door is very very mysterious there's a lot of this kind of mysterious stuff out in this california desert though yeah i love it i, I think that's one of the things that's very very compelling about it but uh so the cats well, didn't like nephra you know what's compelling about the desert though and, and, and that's why and the reason i'm sure it's the same way in australia because I've, I've considered that australia in a lot of ways is very similar to the american um, the thing about the desert that attracts a certain type, a certain type of personality, like a tragic romantic type of personality, the desert always wins. You cannot defeat it. You can defeat forests. People often do. You can defeat entire lakes and destroy them. You cannot defeat the desert. The desert just always wins in the end. 
I like it. Uh, yeah. It's... Yeah, you can't. So it, no. it, and and look movies. at every post-apocalyptic movie you've ever seen. Where is it always set? It's set in a desert. Where our default understanding as human beings is that the desert wins in the end. Yeah. If we destroy everything, we're left with a giant desert. So um, I think you're the first guest, Paul, as far as I can tell on my show, that has sex ghosts mentioned in his Wikipedia um, page. How does that happen? <laughs> How do you accumulate well, I don't sex? Know, I didn't write the Wikipedia page. Um, I, I actually wish that wasn't there. Um, but uh, I, I really need to explain the term. I invented that term. and. Um, it's a good term for what it is. It's just, um, it, it tends to get a lot of attention. Um, what I mean by sex ghosts is just erotic hauntings. And we've already talked about the fact that I, I, I by my own admission, I don't even know what a ghost is or mm. if it exists or if it's actually the spirit of a dead person or, or a psycho, psychological manifestation of a living person. I don't know what a ghost is. It's just one of these unexplained phenomena. And, um, but throughout history, it is notable that many haunting stories have highly erotic elements. These are just the haunting stories that people tend to tell. You know, especially nowadays, it's, it's, you know, it's bad enough if you say you've seen a ghost, because then everyone's going to think you're a little bit cracked. But then if you say you had sex with a ghost, they're really going to think you're cracked. But in fact, a very high percentage of ghost stories do have some kind of sexual or erotic element. And so I started collecting a lot of those stories and I never wrote a book on them, but I wound up doing a lot of lectures on these phenomena because what I found is that it is positively universal and it exists all throughout history. If you go back through ancient mythology, you will suddenly start to see, and you think in these terms, you will suddenly start to see a lot of mythological stories that if someone told them to you today, you would think it's a haunting story with some kind of sexual or erotic overtone. Like think of the story of Zeus and Deny. You know, we tell it as mythology, but the story itself, it's like Zeus has transformed himself into this like glowing golden specter that comes through the, the wall or door of a building. We call that a ghost, right? And then what does he do with Deny? He forms over her and has sex with her. So it's it's actually, to, in our terms, it's an erotic haunting. It becomes what we would consider an erotic ghost story if you take it out of the realm of Zeus and the realm of mythology. Think of St. Teresa of Avila. Think of her her great vision, you know, the, the, the Bernini statue, you know, the angel standing over her. Well, St. Teresa received this enlightenment from this, this angel. They called it an angel who appeared to her, but she just sees this weird glowing flaming body over her. Well, that sounds to us like a ghost. And what did this thing do, this specter? It plunged a rod into her inner. It caused a feeling of intense pain, but a feeling of pain that also brought so much pleasure that she didn't want it to release it. So it's, it's you know, it's basically an orgasm. It's this orgasmic vision. And so, you know, it's like, St. Teresa of Avila, if she told that story today and we take, we, we take God out of it and we take Teresa being a saint out of it, it becomes a, an, another erotic haunting story. It's an erotic ghost story is how we'd consider it or classify it. Yeah, it's, uh, I think about how, the, absolutely, I think about how those kind of uh, tales, and, and Zeus is a very good example. Another one is actually the sort of origin tale in many respects for European witchcraft, which is the watchers laying with the daughters of men. And, and mm -hmm. that's, that, that's an erotic encounter with the extra dimensional. And why I'm phrasing it that way is uh, something Jacques Vallée has been looking at for half a century now is the, even if you call them anal probes and, and all the rest of it, the, um, the sexual motifs of many classic alien encounters also yes. look like encounters with Zeus or what have you, right? They're these sort of yeah. rapes, basically. <laughs> They're not, uh, I mean, in some cases, especially with the ghost stories, that you, it's, it's more of a love story, but it is nevertheless sexual contact with, with the more than human. And as you say, it's universally attested. And whether that's quote unquote, just psychological or what have you, it's nevertheless um, in, our, in our stories. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, I, I used, uh, when I was doing talks about it, and it became a very popular series of talk because let's face it, you put, you know, sex ghost lecture on a flyer, people are going to show up. Um, but uh, when I was doing these, these talks, that, that's what we were talking about, you know, this entire history of erotic haunting. Um, and these stories that were that we consider mythology or we consider science fiction or whatever, but in fact uh, conform in every way to an erotic ghost story. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the, the things you do when you do history a, a little bit or in a unique way, which brings me to like the last question. How do you get a cat to write a history book? Well, I help a little bit. <laughs> Uh, for for those who are uh, unfamiliar with that, uh, I have a cat by the name of Baba who is actually a, a quite well known um, internet cosplay model among cats. You know, cat cosplay is a very weird subgenre, and uh, I I've always been obsessed with feline history because it's another one of these things that are it's kind of on the outside of the margins of normal history. I had after my book Memento Mori. I had planned on writing a book about pet cemetery death, and you know, which would have fit in with that that death theme, because um, no one's ever written a good book about pet cemeteries. It's actually a fascinating subject. But in the process of researching the pet cemetery book, I had researched so much animal history, and especially involving cats, I realized that they had never really gotten their historical due for some absolutely magnificent things that they had done. Um, I'll mention for one thing, I, you know, I know you're in Tasmania, I don't know if the bulk of your listeners are Australian, but, you know, one of, there is a statue in Sydney to one of the greatest historical cats ever, Trim, Matthew Flinders' cat. You know, there are some amazing cats who have done incredible things. And um, anyway, so I determined to push the Pet Cemetery book back and take the character of my cat, since she is a model anyway, and do photos of her in all these historical guises, and then let her tell the history herself in her own book. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. And, and it's one of those, as you say, it's uh, an organism that we've effectively co-evolved civilization with. There's, you can count on one hand the sort of high order mammals that that um, includes. It's like cats, horse, dog, <laughs> uh, we we go all yeah. civilization with them. Uh, it, the, the, it must be a remarkable story. Well, so something happens with cats and dogs both, and um, to the benefit of the dogs and the detriments of detriment of the cats is that increasingly over time we start completely inappropriately, but we as humans start projecting gender on. That cats become the animal that's gendered feminine and dogs become the animal that's gendered masculine. You know, cats be, are thought of as consorts of all these feminine deities. They're consorts of witches, which were, of course, the women who didn't fit in. So cats become gendered feminine as, a, you know, and, and all these attributes that we think of as feminine become projected on cats. You know, they are capricious, they are domestic, they are, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you know, dogs become gendered masculine in a patriarchal society. They get all these these virtues. You know, they are, you know, they are active, loyal, intelligent, trainable, dependable, and so forth. And so, and I think that's why cats kind of you know their contributions to history kind of fell out. The the feline narrator in the book makes a point early on that if it weren't for cats showing up around human civilizations when when humans needed them to rid the early farmers of mice that were plaguing their, their agricultural stores, humans may not have gotten very far on this civilization. No, absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, that's actually what I'm gonna put on the list, as a matter of fact. I, I thought we, I knew we'd, we'd sort of get to it, but uh, I think that's uh, a really, really useful and intriguing take, uh, thought, you know catacomb saints to cats i was wondering where this was going to go but having had it explained to me like that i'm into it well thank you um if i can mention this um again if if a lot of your listeners are australian i am doing in uh 
next month I'm doing a, a virtual book talk with my cat at one of the Melbourne public libraries. It's, I think it's called Glen Eyer. Is that a suburb of Melbourne? Glen Eyre. Um, probably. Uh, we'll we'll yeah. work it out. It'll definitely be in the show notes. Um, most of them are in the US, uh, but um, oh. I, I, heaps of them like cats anyway. And actually the time difference is usually pretty friendly. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get some internationals on the live stream. That'd be awesome. Fair enough. Nice one. Um, where else can people go to find out more about you and your books and, and all the rest of it, that kind of stuff? Hire a private detective. <laughs> find you in the desert. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, it's the standard, you know, uh, you know, the internet, Google, you know, I live out in the desert, but I still keep, you know, I still keep an active Instagram and so forth. I'm on social media. I'm, I'm easy to find. I'm not hiding. Just living away. I'm just living away from civilization, but I'm not hiding. Oh, it's very pleasant. Um, yeah. Uh, and it's hex and cold, isn't it? H-E-X-E-N-K-U-L-T, the German spelling of it. Wonderful. Well, Paul, uh, this has been a great chat. I knew it would be. Um, well, thank uh, you very much. I think this is, uh, yeah, you do some remarkable work and, and you, are, you are a very, you are a singular, unique mind. So, uh, so thank you very much for your time. Okay, well, thank you for having me. I'm doing fewer and fewer of these outros uh, for the most part because everything uh, is typically said uh, in the episodes of late. However, as I was editing this show, uh, it occurs to me that Paul has a way of doing history that almost decenters the human. I mean, in the case of a cat's tail, that is explicit. But it's also in the desert dwelling and the interest in the extra human forces that make civilization provisional you know, deaths and or death in general and deserts and so on. And this really appeals to me at the moment because it brings me back to last week's post about making sanctuary. Uh, according to Dr. Okomalafe, one of the requirements or preceding understandings for making sanctuary is precisely that decentering of the human, that the human is not the center of agency in, in the ongoings of the world and continuing to believe that it is uh, further exacerbates the conditions that require making sanctuary in the first place, right? And the sort of unexpected and unruly collaborations, to borrow a Donna Haraway term, uh, that form part of this sanctuary making process have, as a very good example, as far as I can see, a cat as a co-author of a history book. So be sure to check out the show notes for more info about Paul and what he's got going on, including that library Q&A with Baba at the end of February, um, by the way. So yeah, till next time. Bye.